in June at the U of T talk, so you're, up, you're in for a treat. And then Dr. Sander Hitzig has been a, he's a scientist at St. John's Rehab Research Program around the corner at Sunnybrook and has worked here for many years before that, so it's lovely to see him back. So his program of research is focused on promoting long-term health and well-being in the community for aging and vulnerable populations. And Dr. Raza Mirza is the network manager for the National Institute for the Care of the Elderly, we call it NICE. Um, and he's also a research associate here at the university. Um, so Dr. Mirza's interests are on age-friendly communities and it's, it, how they stems from the role that built and the social environment play in, with respect to late life social, mental, and physical well-being. And Manal is our, our uh, trustee moderator. Hi, go in. Um, and she's a fourth year PhD student in the Faculty of Social Work, in fact, and she previously has been a Royal Bank Fellow at the Institute with us, and she continues to do lots of, uh, lots of work with lots of different hats on. So thank you so much. It's lovely to see a full day of people here. <laughs> Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, Esme, and thank you all for joining us. So, uh, as you can, well, we've moved on to the next slide already. I'm Sander. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I wear many different hats across uh, a lot of institutions across the city. I'm at St. John's. I'm at York, U of T. Today, I'm wearing my nice hat member because uh, this is where a lot of this work has come from. So, what we're hoping today is to give you uh, all a brief overview of some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, Andrea is going to uh, give a very brief overview of the City of Toronto's seniors uh, strategy, uh, which will touch upon its development, structure, and uh, initial achievements. Raza will then take over and talk about some uh, pilot um, aging improvement areas that the City of Toronto identified uh, that were thought to be more vulnerable and, and needed some more uh, support to make them more age friendly. And then I'll finish off talking about the initiative that I'm leading with Raza, Andrea, and others. Uh, to make the Toronto, Kensington, Chinatown neighborhood, or the KCN, which is, uh, which is one of the neighborhoods that was identified by this uh, pilot aging uh, improvement indicator uh, project, to make that uh, neighborhood more age friendly. So I'm going to turn it over, and then at the end we're going to have a, a, a discussion and, and talk about our experiences working on uh, these different initiatives. The lessons piece. The lessons piece. Yeah. Great. So um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of a, a story of what happened to me and how this landed on my desk. So in 2013, Councillor Josh Matlow, who is now the, um, the seniors advocate for the city, he's kind of the minister responsible for seniors at the municipal level, had a motion passed to council to address the fact that, uh, to address the demographic pressures that are coming and to, the, the motion that passed was to direct staff to work with community partners, older Torontonians, aging experts, and so on, to develop a strategic plan for the city to get ready for this. So um, it hit me at the same time as my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and uh, my father was dying of cancer. And so I was like, as a, I'm just a policy staff, like general social policy staff at the City of Toronto. I didn't have any special knowledge on CCACs and the LINs and who does what, and I, I didn't. So um, so the first thing I did, one of the one of the things, I'm a PhD dropout, by the way. I, I discovered policy, and I, used to, I was working on my PhD for a long time, but I found it too kind of theoretical, and, um, and I just like policy because it's right in the middle between theory and practice. And you can actually design programs and you know, run them in a neighborhood and see actual physical change. So, um, I, but I do like both and feel very comfortable in both environments. But I was very lucky to inherit this file. And one of the things, one of the things I like about working for municipal government as opposed to being ac an academic is there's no such thing as intellectual property. So <laughs> this slide, it was not developed by me. This is developed by uh, the region of Peel. Like if it's a good idea in the government, it's a good idea. But nonetheless, this was um, developed by the region of Peel. They do some amazing work when it comes to uh, aging and age friendly. So this is all of the government services, ministries, programs, et cetera, at the federal level. This is all of them at the provincial level. It's a little bit out of date, we have to fix that up. Uh, this is the municipal level. 
and it doesn't even include all of the community-based not-for-profit sector work that so many senior services are run and they are cobbled <laughs> together from funding from like this level, this level, this level, uh, and United Way and Trillium, and et cetera, uh, but so important for the day-to-day -day lives of, of uh, older Torontonians. So, um, so it landed on my desk. What do I do? Uh, how, what, how am I going to do this? So I looked back at all of the previous uh, recommendations and reports that had been adopted by council that had any recommendations related to seniors. Sometimes it was like the Housing Opportunities Toronto, the Affordable Housing Plan. Sometimes it was the Seniors Recreation Plan, um, Toronto Community Housing, whatever, wherever. I pulled them all together into an Excel spreadsheet and I just tried to figure out whether they were fully implemented, partially implemented, or not at all implemented. And I discovered that when a recommendation, first of all, let me just say that I was running around City Hall going like, was this ever done? Mm -hmm. Trying to figure it out. And so many people said to me, I've never seen it before. I didn't even know about it. So <coughs> there was some, you know, the, when you think about how many times you hear about, oh, these recommendations in this report are released, what really happens to those recommendations? Mm -hmm. And who's following up to make sure that they're actually acting yeah. on? So, um, so I also uh, figured out uh, pivot tables in Excel, and I discovered this, that if the recommendation was directed at the city family proper, so one of 46 divisions of the city of Toronto, that the city manager and council are like, you know, can directly control, they were implemented about 66% of the time, so it should have been 100, right, if council directs staff to do it, should have been done, but anyway. And then, if it was, if the recommendation was directed at one of those city services that are run through independent boards, like the TTC or the police or Toronto Community Housing, um, it dropped in half, like 33% or whatever. It just didn't happen. And when you think about it, city council doesn't, city council approves the budget of the police, but they don't tell the police what to do. Like, it's the Toronto Police Services Board, <coughs> and Library Board, and et cetera, Toronto Community Housing Board. So, not surprising. And then when we told the province what to do, they did it less than like 17% of the time. And then the feds, we told them what to do, they did it less than 4% of the time. So that is why there are no recommendations in Toronto Senior Strategy 1.0, the first one, uh, directed at the, the federal provincial government. And I think we're now in the process of developing the next uh, 2.0. Uh, whether that has changed or shifted, I don't know. But I mean that represented a decade worth of decades worth of work, right? And you think about all the consultation and everything that goes into developing recommendations, and then they were just they were just sitting on shelves. They weren't being acted upon. So I want to make sure that it would that would never happen to any other policy staff in the future. So <laughs> um, go ahead and next one. Um, actually, we need to skip by that one. Unfortunately, this thing isn't working. I won't be able to do it. So, um, so what I did was make it very clear that each recommendation is directed at. Um, no, going one more time. <laughs> there. <laughs> so each recommendation has a very clear like who is responsible for doing this because some of those recommendations that the earlier recommendations were just poorly developed recommendations, right? They're just like, the city should celebrate seniors. I don't know, how did we do that? It's just not, it's not, it's a vague recommendation. So every recommendation was very, very clear about who X is required to do Y by Z time with a progress measure of exactly whether, how you're gonna know whether or not that was done. And the other thing is, we, so we built this accountability into it, and we also committed to going back every single year to committee and council to say, here's the status. Here, I list every single recommendation. And, and this just happened the um, day before yesterday. Uh, I brought this for progress report, the second one, on, um, on 1.0 to the Community Development and Recreation Committee at City Hall. And there's a, it's a you know, big, fat report that lists every single recommendation, whether it is fully, partially, or not at all implemented, and why. 
And let me tell you, people at City Hall say to me, Andrea, this is a happening because we know you're coming after us, right? <laughs> Every year, like, they have to do it because otherwise, they, if, if transportation services is supposed to do something, lengthen the crossing times in neighborhoods with a lot of seniors, for example, uh, and they don't do it, then, then it's going to be like it's a transparency, <coughs> right? And being, and it's really just about changing the rela our relationship with council. Accountability is about honesty and transparency. So we don't put on like a lot of people at City Hall try to put on a big show, impress the councillors. No, this is also about our dirty laundry. Like if we're not able to do, s and there are some recommendations that we have not been able to move on. I mean, of the of the original 91 recommendations, as of Wednesday of this week, 90 of them have been either fully or partially implemented, and well over 60% are fully <coughs> complete. And that's only up to three years. So when you think about that compared to that earlier kind of decade of recommendations that were not moving, I think we, we figured out how to do a better strategy uh, at City Hall. So, uh, so now this is the standard for all uh, strategies um, at City Hall. They're, they all have this kind of accountability mechanism built right in. Okay. So key accomplishments. So there are 91 recommendations across the eight age-friendly domains. I'm not going to go into it. I'm just going to highlight a couple, maybe depending on the time. Good. Um, okay, so one of the ones I'm uh, really excited about was we identified seniors living in Toronto community housing that call 911 all the time. And my mom, when she was had uh, beginnings of dementia, Alzheimer's, she was doing this. She would think she saw something or whatever. And sometimes I was in the house, but I didn't realize, like, it was in the middle of the night. She would get up and, and call 911, and I would be awakened because there were, you know, there were police and ambulance at the door. So we identified specific seniors living in Toronto community housing that were calling 911 all the time. And we applied for, uh, through the Ministry of Health, through the Community Paramedicine Program, we have, uh, applied for $300,000 to hire three community paramedics to go knock on the doors of those particular seniors and, um, and talk to them about their prescriptions, what do they need. And of course, it turns out that a lot of them didn't need emergency medical care. That's not what they needed. They needed to be connected to community and health services. They needed to be connected to Meals on Wheels or they had language or literacy issues, or it was the beginning of cognitive impairment issues. Um, but it was, um, after six months, by the way, those call volumes went down by 49%. So you think about how much money that saves the municipal government, the provincial government, uh, and just it's a far better outcome. Because what they need is ongoing relationships and, and connections in the community, not emergency to just come in in a crisis situation and disappear. So that's a, by the way, that program was extended one year, frankly, because there was a lot of um, fuss in the press about it. And so the Minister, um, Minister Eric Hoskins extended it for one year, but it is set to expire in March of next year. So, so we still have a lot of work to do. So that's one. What else do I want to talk about? Um, oh, I guess the other one is around <coughs> new training for staff. So if, you, um, if you've never read A Duty to Care, it's a 2010 report from the Ombudsman, the Toronto Ombudsman, former Fiona Cream. She's the uh, Ombudsman at Hydro now. So what happened was there was a woman with clear cognitive impairment, diminished capacity issues, and municipal licensing and standards went in and removed a tree on her private property. So the report is all about how badly she was treated by municipal licensing and standards staff. That, combined with the Toronto Senior Strategy, um, produced, we developed new training for staff. So, um, we, and we really just had to explain to staff that as city staff, we serve all residents, including those who are vulnerable. Uh, if you need city services, it's not like if you don't like Rogers, you can go to TELUS, or if you, if you need city services, that's the only game in town. So we needed to kind of up the game with civil servants, and and that means not turning all 28,000 people who work at City Hall into social workers, but to get them to understand that they have a duty um, to 
go up to people, seniors, anybody that um, that looks like they need help and try to explain the like, that's the issue with a there are communication issues oftentimes when you have diminished capacity. And I see this all the time at City Hall. Like, people walk up, and sometimes seniors walk up to the information booth and they're like, they clearly need something, but they're just having difficulty articulating it. So we've trained all the frontline staff to walk up to them, to ask, to start a conversation, to be very respectful, to say, you know, would, would it be helpful if I wrote this down for you? It's really basic, you know, good customer service, but um, because of, there are going to be so many more people needing services uh, from the municipal government that are experiencing some kind of cognitive impairment or etc., uh, we needed to do this. And that leads to just another um, important point, and that is that the challenges of aging can sometimes intersect with and amplify other vulnerabilities related to language, literacy, citizenship, um, where you live in the city, geography, uh, your access to services, mobility, um, mental health, substance use, etc. It's the, it's the compounding effect that sometimes can render people vulnerable. And we throw that term around a lot, vulnerable, and what does it mean? For us at the city, what it really means is that somebody lacks formal or informal supports. So when, um, when I started, when I became overnight really a full-time caregiver for my mom, because my dad wasn't there anymore, uh, I had to navigate this system. I had to be her advocate. You have to make sure that this specialist is, is communicating with it on, and like you have long-term care and CCAC, and and you have um, paramedics and the hospital, and it's just a, it's a, it's a very difficult system to navigate, and that's for me who was born in Canada and works for government, very very complicated. I mean, confounding, uh, confusing system, and that system, it's not really a system because it's a bunch of different silos really when you think about it that don't talk to each other. And I don't know why it is that government is so by nature siloed, but this kind of whole of government approach is not something that we do well as government. We don't. Um, for example, Toronto Community Housing will sometimes <coughs> evict a vulnerable senior when we are paying at municipal level about $300 a month for their housing. That's the subsidy. Evict them, they go into shelter for $90 a day, hospital $1,000 a day, Prison, right, $200 a day, because a lot of older people with uh, cognitive impairment issues are experiencing conflict with the law for the first time. But this is like, we, we do this as government. We just pass these people around. It makes no sense. So we really need to be taking that whole of government approach. But it's a real challenge for us. It's not in our DNA. It's not in government DNA. Um, so I think that's it in terms of the, there, I'm happy to talk about the other 91, uh, the other 989 <laughs> recommendations and, um, and so the, the successes that we've had and we've also had some challenges too. <clears throat> and I, I can tell you some stories as soon as we turn that camera off. <laughs> so um, I think I'll leave it from there. I just want to say that moving forward, we're doing a completely new approach to 2.0 that we haven't tried before at City Hall. Normally, the city staff person is the lead, and they just have a, a community advisory table, and they might go, you know, a couple times before uh, something goes forward to committee and council, but they don't have to take the, the advice of that group, of that body, right? It's just for input and advice. We're swapping. We're just getting rid of that for the 2.0 process. We're doing a complete co-creation, co-design with the accountability table, which um, these gentlemen sit on, and and it has hospitals, CCACs, uh, the LINs, uh, uh, advisory advocacy groups for seniors, the Toronto Seniors Forum, older Torontonians, caregivers, LGBT uh, senior seniors, um, ethno-racial, and because we need to understand the ethno-racial and linguistic needs of seniors, um, uh, faith-based groups. Um, indigenous, etc. So we are co-creating the next Toronto Senior Strategy 2.0 with that table, like shoulder to shoulder. Um, the city is merely a kind of a backbone entity, a backbone, we provide kind of backbone support to facilitate that table developing the next strategy. So 
I will leave it there. Thank you. So I'll talk a little bit about this co-creation process. And as was mentioned, uh, Sandra and I both sit on the accountability table, so we were also very happy when this file fell on our desks. And we were happy the fact that the city was taking a very proactive approach to, you know, making services and the built and social environment a lot more age friendly. And one of the key domains of age friendliness that we wanted to explore as part of this project that we're going to talk about a little more is social isolation. Next slide, please. So some of the domains that we, some of the indicators that we looked at to figure out, you know, what are we going to focus on as part of this study? And one of the things that you want to keep in mind is the KCN is one of 10 areas in the city, 10, right? Yeah. 10 areas in the city that have been identified as aging improvement areas. And so the KCN has specific factors as do these other um, improvement areas. For example, a high density number of seniors, they have high rates of OAS, GIS, which means that they are um, income based and therefore they're low income seniors. There's a lot of seniors living alone and that's tied into things like health issues and needing formal care, um, low income as well. There's a lot of first generation immigrants in this, in this KCN area and also in the other aging improvement areas. And that sets up some other barriers as well in terms of language, access to health care. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little more in the lesson section. And also, the, just to point out about this is English is often a second language and French is often non-existent in these areas. So on this slide, you'll see that the KCN, there's a little yellow arrow there somewhere, right? You can just click on it. You'll be able to see it in a second. Now it works now? Oh, well, now well, it's working. It's working too well. Um, <laughs> the arrow which should pop up. Anyways, there should be an arrow that highlights to you the fact that the KCN is surrounded by high income areas, but the KCN itself is a very low income area. Okay, so the low income as well, weaving into some of the things that we're talking about. Is it there? Yes. No, these are just the uh, top the 10 KCN. areas and the KCN's on the later side. The KCN's on the later side. Yes, okay, so it'll, we'll see it on the next slide here. It's number six. It's number six. It's number six. All right, here it is. Right there. there. People who are following along here, there's KCN right there, and all the high income neighborhoods all around it. But there's a real key issue here that I'm going to highlight again in, in one of the later slides is that it's home to two different groups of immigrants. There's a new group of immigrants who speak Cantonese and Mandarin who are coming to Toronto, migrating to the city and living here. And there's another group of citizens that have been in the, in the country and have stayed in this community for over 60 years, some of them. So you've got really new immigrants and you've got people who've been settled and socialized within this environment. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah. So how did this all come together? I'm just giving you an overview of the actual project itself. So this file falls on our desk. We're really happy about it. It displaces some of the other ones that we weren't so interested in. And this age-friendly initiative is specific for the KCN um, for a number of reasons. First of all, because of the partnerships that NICE has developed, we were able to recruit some good partners who would work with us to make sure that this project was seen to fruition. Um, and so we, we are actually the co-leads. So Sandra and I are the co-leads on this project uh, and NICE is spearheading this particular one. And I want you to remember again that we're focusing specifically on the domain of social isolation. Okay, next slide. So this is what our team is. And, and most importantly, I want you to know that this project would not be possible, A, without our partners, and B, without the students who work on this research. And so, um, Manal is one of the students that works on this. The other ones are not here. House and Sun, Anadu, and uh, Aurora Zoo. Because of our own language barriers, we can't conduct the research <laughs> in the community. And so they've been really instrumental in reaching out to participants in this area and making strong connections. And, and we've had um, a really high success rate uh, in terms of con conducting our surveys and running our focus groups. So that's been really uh, the, the backbone of this research for us. N NICE is a, is a knowledge transfer network. You can find out more information about NICE at nicenet.ca. The Toronto Council on Aging, which is also one of our partners, it provides leadership and education to enhance the experience of aging and encourage age-friendly policies. So they run their own age-friendly uh, projects as well, and so they're one of our partners. The Toronto Community and Culture Centre, it, de it delivers social and settlement services in Mandarin within that community. So I'll tell you about the importance of that in a second. The Canadian Urban Institute and obviously the City of Toronto with Andrea and Heath who works in the research division. That's been excellent for all of us. Now, so why the KCN? So the KCN, I told you, is home to two sort of different groups of immigrants. 
One of them is the group that's just newly arrived here, speaks Cantonese and Mandarin, can't communicate in English or French. And then there's the other one that's lived and worked in, that, in the city or, or elsewhere, but um, resides in the KCN. The other real logistic reason why we chose the KCN is because of our partnership with the TCCC. So that is one of the things that happens in research, is that it's actually just easier for us to look at this aging improvement area. Of the 10 that were available, this is the one we had the strongest partnerships with, and that's why we chose that particular area. Now this is a bit of a busy map, but again I want you to see the income levels. I think the arrow should show up. The arrow, there it is, the arrow, okay. <laughs> Um, so that's where the KCN is in comparison to some of the other places. I want you to see also in terms of the built environment. You see it's close to a subway line, all right? One of the other facilitators for people aging in place. And we'll talk about that in terms of some of the lessons. There it is. Okay, I'll very quickly go over the ethnicity in the, in the community and I'll, I'll give you a profile as we talk about some of the lessons later. So the ethnicity uh, breakdown in this community are, are most of the, the individuals who reside here are of Chinese background, okay? So Chinese background, we start to <coughs> unpack it a little bit more. There's a great diversity in this population based on language, based on where they live in China, okay? Education, all sorts of different domains. Next slide. And the language, again, pre predominantly Cantonese or Mandarin, okay? So I'll hand it over to Sandra and he'll tell you a little bit more okay. about the action plan that we are going to be coming up with. Thank you, so you can see from Andrea's presentation, the broad city's viewpoint in terms of making the city more age-friendly and that how, how some other work has influenced our decision to choose the KCN. So what are we actually doing? So the, the ultimate goal of our initiative is to develop an action plan for the KCN, which is essentially a smaller and more targeted version of the uh, city's uh, senior strategy. Uh, it follows the same principles and aligns with a number of the recommendations, but again, taking into account that not all the neighborhoods are the same, that uh, you know, language comes into play, um, poverty, all these uh, different issues, that it's great to have a citywide strategy, but sometimes you need to have a, go into a, a particular neighborhood and really get an understanding of the specific challenges. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I said, the ultimate goal is to come up with this action plan, which is right in the center of that, that diagram right here. And what we want to do is have an action plan that is evidence-based and that's also feasible to implement. You know, so as you know, Andrea is the policy wonk, uh, and I'm the bookworm researcher. I love research. I'm, I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are differences in terms of you know how research is used. Or research can be a very slow and you know time-consuming process. Anyone here in graduate school? Yes. You get through. Don't worry. <laughs> so y'all, so you understand that. But. So what we've done, though, is really taken a uh, community-based uh, research approach where that we're really engaging people in the community, but what we're doing has an academic backbone so that all the activities that so we want to you know, look at the literature, get an understanding of what are some of the issues um, before we actually go into the neighborhood. Because again, I, I didn't know anything about Chinese in depth, and we wanted to know what are some of the challenges, uh, you know, and to also influence in terms of what are some of the questions we want to ask. We just don't want to go in with our own surveys and say this is what's important. We want to see what other people have done who have looked at these issues so that we're picking the right tools to ask the right questions. Uh, oh, no, I'll go back. Um, and then in terms of doing an environmental scan, we actually want to talk to people who live and work in that neighborhood, right? They're the ones who are going to hopefully be the... Uh, uh, be, receive the benefits of that plan. Um, so it's really important that we get their perspective. So how we're doing that is doing some surveys and uh, qualitative interviews, and I'll go into that in a minute. And then the ultimate plan is to take all this information, so look at the literature, talk to people who live in that neighborhood, the older adults themselves, the practitioners, talk to people at City Hall, uh, you know, hopefully do some outreach to other government organizations as well, and then hold a one-day consensus meeting so all this information, we're going to generate all these priorities and have the right mix of people. So it's not just researchers, it's not just policy, it's older adults themselves, it's researchers, it's policy people, practitioners, and pick the top five priorities. Because there might be a hundred priorities out there, but you can't always do everything at once. So what are the most pressing priorities? And then to come up with an action plan uh, that's actually feasible so that 
the people who are at that table will actually have buy-in. Because again, if I came up with an action plan, I, you know, I do all this research and then I came up with the plan, people say, well, yeah, no, Sanders brilliant, but you know, he doesn't really understand what are the issues are. So it's really important that we're engaging everybody who has a stake in that neighborhood so that whatever we come up with will have a higher likelihood of being successful. Next slide, please. So just roughly, you know, the first thing we did is, is looking at the literature, and Manal actually spearheaded a lot of that work. And we looked not only at what was in the peer review literature, but also what's in the gray literature. So we looked at reports. So there were some community organizations that had done some work and had generated reports with recommendations, and looked at um, uh, other, uh, other uh, sources of information that were available. And really, this was sort of the starting point in terms of figuring out what were some of the key issues. Next slide. So again, we organized this whole initiative around the World Health Organization's age-friendly dimensions that uh, Andrea had uh, touched upon. And these are uh, you know, social participation, community support and health services, housing. And we, you know, we were trying to figure out what were some of the issues. So in terms of community support and health services, there's a need for more advertising of these services. People aren't always aware of what's out there. So again, that's something that we keep in the back of our mind as we're doing the scan is the city or different organizations being effective in their advertising. Looking at housing, living alone is a, is a significant risk factor for um, uh, social isolation and loneliness. And this is actually found in any ethnic group. Uh, it, this is one of the, the strongest predictors. And again, when Raza was talking about the um, pilot uh, indicator neighborhoods, you saw that in the KCN, almost 40% of older adults in that neighborhood were living alone. Uh, so imagine if you're living alone and you don't have support. You know, Andrea talked about her mother and, and, and you, know, you were the support for providing the care that she needed. But if you're living alone and you don't have that support, what could happen? Uh, so these are important issues that we, you know, that we were looking at the literature to, uh, uh, as we were doing our planning process. Next slide. And again, you know, issues of respect and social inclusion. One thing that NICE does a lot of work on is the issue of elder abuse, uh, which isn't always labeled as elder abuse in particular communities. Uh, so, you know, when we looked at the literature, we actually did find one article on that, uh, on that issue in, in older Chinese adults, but it's framed as disrespect and not necessarily elder abuse per se, and even NICE developed a tool, what's it called, for the uh, Chinese community about elder abuse? It's, it's, it's not called the elder abuse tool for older Chinese adults, it's pathways. Oh, pathways, yeah, I think. Pathways to enlightenment or something mm. that, that's a, that a person could take and that they're not walking around with a sign saying, I may be undergoing kind of elder abuse. So it's, it's having an understanding of these cultural <coughs> issues. So again, so we looked at all this literature. So this was sort of the first part. And then the next thing is to talk to people and, and figure out what are the issues. So looking at the literature was really helpful in coming up with the questions that we needed to ask. Uh, so we wanted to survey 100 older adults in that community, asking them questions about uh, what types of resources are they using, how important were they to maintaining their health and well-being in the community, were they actually able to access them easily, were they able to walk to them, do they need to take a car, do they need someone else to take them to access it, and then we asked a whole host of questions about their physical, mental, and social health using uh, a variety of tools uh, that have been validated for uh, older Chinese adults. Um, so we have a, a rough understanding of what some of the issues are. But again, if you've ever answered a survey or given a survey, we don't always fit in that neat little box as much as a researcher that, you know, in my, my soul I wish everybody would fit in a box <laughs> and we could answer all the questions. We wanted to talk to people, so Raza and uh, the students organized a number of focus groups where we pulled together people living in that community and asked them in depth, what do you like about living in the, in the neighborhood? What are some of the challenges? Uh, and at the end, Raza will we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of the lessons. And actually, lessons. We, were, we had agreed that we would do 100 surveys, and we'll do the 100 surveys, and we had agreed that we would do two focus groups, but we actually ended up having such a high turnout that we did three focus groups. <laughs> and so one of them, there was only 10 people who had agreed to come to the focus group, and we had used this exact same room, and there was 23 people. Wow. So we were scrambling to put consent forms together and, and things like yeah. that, but that's how successful we feel that this project's been, that mm -hmm. there's a buy-in from the community as well. And of course, it's, you know, the issue is around social isolation and loneliness, so it's hard to get to those older adults who may be isolated, who may not be able to come. So the other thing we did is we had a focus group with practitioners. So we had some geriatricians, social workers, and other 
uh, people who work in that neighborhood who, who often see these cases give their insights onto it. So that way we had a broad uh, perspective on all the issues and then hopefully we captured as much uh, as uh, possible. Next slide. So we're taking all this information and we're having our meeting on March 2nd um, uh, on 2017 at the Mars Center just uh, across the street uh, from, uh, from us. And hopefully we're going to have up to 50 people and again getting a good representation of people that we've done outreach. So Raza and the students have done a lot of canvassing. We're going out to different uh, community centers. Uh, I forget all the names. Food courts. Mm -hmm. Food courts. Um, but there are certain community centers that, uh, that provide a number of uh, recreation services for older Chinese adults. Scouting court. Stand, scouting court. Scouting court and, things, and those types of places. But we'll get those representatives, people from the uh, CCAC, uh, people from the provincial government, people from City Hall, one or two researchers, we don't want to you know, dirty it too much, um, but just a few researchers, and get some actual older adults as well, and maybe caregivers attend this meeting so that we can come up with the top five priorities. So all this information that we're gathering, we're generating a whole list. The morning session will be voting on the top five priorities so we can sort of focus our efforts. And then the afternoon, we'll be coming up with an action plan around those different priorities. So that it's not just a list of recommended priorities, then we're done. It's really, what are the priorities, and what can we actually do? And when you have somebody from City Hall and the CCAC and a social worker all sitting around together, you can actually come up with some solutions. And one of the things that was interesting when I met with Andrea and uh, Councillor Joe Cressy, he said one of the big things is if you can even get people in the same room and be aware of the different services, that will advance things tremendously for, for getting people to talk and maybe come up with some solutions. If you don't mind, I just wanted to add yeah. one point. One of the things that happened that was very interesting for me is that in the focus group with the service providers and the clinicians who work in the KCN, they started exchanging business cards in the middle of the focus group because they said, well, I didn't even know you work next door to, to me. If I had known, I wouldn't have referred this person so far away or, or I would know how to find you now. So that was a very interesting thing that happened as an observation during the actual focus group when they started to talk. So this is just an example uh, of what we're going to present because we're going to come up with a report and I'm not expecting anyone to do their homework who's going to come to this meeting, but we want at least one piece that people can sort of focus on so they can actually get a sense of what are the priorities and where they're coming from. It doesn't mean that because it's, let's say you have one priority and all three groups are, are, are um, only one group is, is voting on it, that it's, um, that it's not important, but sometimes when you see that all three you have that triangulation where you see that it's coming from the practitioners, that it's coming from the older adults as well, that may help focus getting some consensus around what priorities really need to be addressed. So this is just an example of, and we actually have to do the work and generate the real priorities, but this is, this is what hopefully we're going to use. So again, hopefully the action plan, uh, again, it's going to be you know, evidence-based because we've looked at the literature, we've talked to people in that neighborhood, we've followed research ethics so that the way that we collected the data followed all the ethical standards and that we've applied some rigor in terms of how we're looking at the data and, and pulling it together. Um, and that, that once we're done, that the city will actually have a report that they can use and we can disseminate to people working and living in that neighborhood to help them, uh, you know, make that neighborhood more age-friendly and so that they're uh, being more active and, and uh, their well-being is, um, is, is going up. And the other idea is that if this is successful, fingers crossed, this could serve as a useful template across other neighborhoods. We chose the KCN for, because just of circumstances, we had the right group of people, but we could have gone to Thorncliff and done the same steps and come up with an action plan, again, that's mm -hmm. evidence space. We could have gone to any other neighborhood and have this, again, I call it an academic backbone, by involving uh, people from the community and other groups to come up with the knowledge and to develop the action plan that's going to be meaningful for them. So I'm going to turn over to Raz. Is this is lesson one or is this time? No, we'll go, this is the timeline. Okay, so it's still me. Yeah? All right, okay. so where are we are with the project? <laughs> Uh, so we've done the spoken room and all got it accepted for publication. Um, we've done our environmental scan where we actually had a student uh, from urban planning, I didn't mention, use the uh, Toronto Wellbeing app, if any of you are familiar, which ties into all these different data uh, sources, so the census uh, 411, to look at all the different organizations in the KCN, whether they're hospitals, churches, libraries. So it was a really useful tool to help us figure out who we needed to go 
do our outreach to. Um, uh, telephone surveys are almost done. Raz has completed all the uh, uh, focus groups. Mm -hmm. Number four, March 2nd is our consensus meeting, and then hopefully by, I mean, last slide, by the uh, summer, we'll have the report done, and uh, we can move on to bigger and better things. Mm -hmm. I'll turn over to okay, so we'll go to the last slide, and this hopefully will lead to our discussion. So how do we make all of these domains and all this other stuff that we're talking about? And just, I think you can just click through all of them. It's no surprises here. Um, I've, I've circulated this document for uh, some of the tables here. And this is the checklist of essential features of age-friendly cities from the World Health Organization. It's a color copy that you should have. I want you to look at this very quickly. So there's all the different domains that we talked about, but one of the key things that I want to highlight for you is that it says that this the checklist is a tool for city self-assessment and a map for charting progress. Okay? So what does that actually mean in terms of these things that are outlined and that will make a city age-friendly? First of all, do any of you know how to define or could you give me an example of what it means for something to be age-friendly? What does it mean? very academic, loaded question. We spend years debating things like this. What does it mean to be age-friendly? Sorry? I have to say, it's not academic if you are actually a senior. It's not academic if you're a senior. So that, that's going to be an excellent segue into another point that I want to make, is that a lot of these things that we're talking about in this checklist don't include the voice of the senior. Okay? And, and I want to highlight that one of the things that... So these are some of the things that I feel our project team has learned, and I believe this will be a benchmark for the action plan. And first thing is, the conversations about age friendliness across domains, across, for instance, neighborhoods, communities, different levels of government, between different universities and researchers, it's very, very difficult to talk about age friendliness when we're all talking about the same thing. This is something you're going to hear a lot in, in, in academic settings, but the problem is that we've been given these eight buckets of age friendliness that we're supposed to fill, and we're filling them in different ways and talking about age friendliness in different ways. The other thing, and I think you mentioned this yesterday at our meeting, what was that word you used? About, it's not it bougie. Oh, bougie. It's a bit bougie. <laughs> it's a bit bougie. It's a bit middle class. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the domains themselves were kind of stuck with because, I mean, they're, they're good in many ways. But um, I think that they don't necessarily take into account kind of diversity, right. equity, um, sexism, racism, the fact that seniors are racialized, uh, LGBT seniors, all of low income seniors, all of those issues are not really in the foreground with that, uh, with these buckets. And, um, and the other thing is that they, they direct everything at cities, which in some ways is good because I think cities do have the kind of closest, most uh, engaged relationship with residents. But on the other hand, we are the, the, the order of government that is in many ways least resourced. And if you think about the federal government being responsible for kind of in, income support, and then the province for health and primary care and home care, and then cities, I mean, really the things that, we're, that we could easily control if we had some more money, and things like park benches and pedestrian safety, as you all know, the number of um, seniors who are killed on our streets, like of the people who, uh, of the pedestrians who are killed or seriously injured every year in Toronto, the majority are seniors, like 80%. So it's a huge issue. So those are things that are, uh, and recre community recreation, things like that are within our ability to control. But if you think about affordable housing or the issue around social housing, even the TTC and transportation, I mean, really, some of these things are, are city-run uh, kind of under protest, like they were downloaded, and we're not adequately resourced on the in terms of the the um, the dollar of, of how much tax you pay. Like five to eight cents on the dollar goes to municipalities. And then, you know, the, the, the next most amount goes to the province and then to the feds. So in some ways, putting it all at the, hand, at the feet of cities is problematic. So I'll go through the other three lessons very quickly. I want to leave time for there to be questions and discussion. But one of the other key things that has stuck with me throughout this research process is that we are talking about providing services for seniors. And we're, providing about, uh, we're talking about providing programs for seniors. 
But what, what we really need to do when we think about age friendliness is think about how do we engage seniors within the process as well so the relationships are reciprocal, okay? Not for seniors, with seniors. That whole co-creation element we want to really bring to the forefront as part of this action plan. The other thing is about the places where you wouldn't imagine being somewhere someone would think is age friendly, like the food court where we, re we recruited a lot of the older adults for the study. That's where people go to socialize, at the food court, around lottery terminals. I'm not kidding, that's where we put up some of our, our uh, recruitment posters and had a very high response rate because seniors would congregate in those areas. Um, these are places that we overlook, but that, there are places where the built and social environment sort of intersect. I think the final point that I want to make, and this is the one that bothers me the most, is that checklists like this, when we talk about domains and indicators, this actually doesn't mean anything unless we can measure or evaluate or respond to all of these different domains. And so the next thing that we want to be working on is coming up with a score or a measure for age friendliness. Because until you do something like that, there's no real response that you can take. People don't know if they're age friendly or un age unfriendly programs and services community cities and so we need there to be a benchmark where we can work from and as of right now none exists and hopefully um, based on this research and other work that we've proposed to do nice and its partners will be able to come up with something um, an algorithm or some way to measure and quantify this as a starting point so that'll that's it for the lessons and we will take I think Questions? Yeah. And uh, just before we do, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the uh, Ontario Senior Secretariat that's funding uh, our research, uh, our uh, this age-friendly community planning grant to make this work possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. So on behalf of the group, I want to thank our panel today for such an exciting presentation, you know, walking us through the work that's being done at the municipal level about the Toronto Senior Strategy, and then we heard from Razia and Sander about how those recommendations actually get sort of translated in practice and in research, and then how the learnings from that research can then be, you know, can inform the municipal government and the service sector. So we have about 10 minutes, and I'm going to open the floor uh, for comments and questions, and... Uh, also, just a little side note, we will stick around for a little bit after if there's questions that you want to ask outside the context of this presentation. Right, okay, okay, yeah. Thank you so much for <coughs> your presentations. Um, I'm interested in the third lesson learned, the... the participating uh, thing. Mm -hmm. I wrote down uh, decision power. Um, my background is in occupational therapy and anthropology um, and I was surprised that um, the older adults were very interested in coming to the focus groups mm -hmm. and interacting with you guys about this subject but the decision power in your consensus meeting is very much professional oriented. You will invite older adults, yes, as yes, I believe, yes. but why not give them more power about their community? In terms of how? In terms of number, a number of older adults? Maybe. So there's a few things. So A, we definitely want representation, so we want them to be able to attend. Uh, so we're going to have uh, um, spaces available, and I think we'll invite at least around five or more. Mm -hmm. uh, other things is pra pragmatics is that you can't have a meeting that's too large because then it becomes very difficult to manage. At the same time, related to the uh, development of the action plan, they'll have insight into the priorities and we'll actually circulate a pre-voting on what are the top five priorities and then drill it down at the actual meeting. But you need people who actually work in that community, who know the services and who actually can figure out what to do at that meeting. So hopefully by having a balanced representation of older adults, practitioners, government, a couple of researchers that we can all come up with something that everyone would be satisfied with. But again, by going into the community and doing the focus groups, they're the ones who are driving the priorities. I'm not going to come up with a priority because I've read it in a paper. But it's the voting process is will be open to everybody and hopefully we'll gain consensus on it. So the, the short list of prior, priorities and actions are actually driven by what the respondents have said in their surveys, what the respondents have you know um, said in the focus groups. So it, we're, it's, it's a distillation of all of that into these domains that we'll be talking about at the consensus meeting. So it is, it is sort of driven by the community yeah. and not by our evidence and literature or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Pat Armstrong, New York University. Hi. Um, 
I thank you for this uh, fascinating and important project, I think. I'm, we heard about income, we heard about age, we heard about culture, we heard about language, but we didn't hear about gender. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me this is a really important issue in the literature you're reviewing, or at least it should be, mm -hmm. given who, who the old are and the yeah. differences in their needs and interests. Luckily for me, I have this little graph from the, the data <laughs> that, that highlights that 73% of the participants in our study were older women. Yeah, given um, that their proportion population. In that, in that area as well, and that most of them did report being socially isolated and feeling vulnerable. I mean, beyond that, we don't have much data at this point. We're still in the process of collecting our final interviews, but as a quick snapshot, there is a gendered issue in this community, and I uh, would expect that it might be the same in other aging improvement areas as well because looking at the you know just as an example of OAS and GIS if you look at the breakdown of the recipients of that they are older women who are widowed or living alone so, okay, so I, I, I wanted to um, address the question of the the collaboration and alignment that I see between you know the different initiatives and uh, I think that's very impressive and also, I, I, I do think it speaks to the importance of a backbone, academic backbone and the benefits of that. Um, and um, I just wanted to make a quick comment uh, about the, the metrics that I hope that within the devel developing those metrics, you will also develop some flexibility because I think with your neighborhood approach, I think you, you're seeing that it's probably going to change um, within different communities. And just to a little bit introduce myself, so I'm, um, I'm based at Mount Sinai Hospital uh, Brightman Center, but I'm part of a collective that uh, focuses specifically on senior caregiver isolation, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a niche within what you're, um, what you're doing. And, and I guess I'm interested to know if any of your data um, has surfaced any um, specific issues um, around caregiving in that population, and I'm just interested um, if any of that has, has surfaced in your um, in your research. Um, you know, we just mentioned the the ratio between genders, but also if I look at the ratio within caregivers, the majority of the caregivers, I think it's around 80 percent, is um, older women. So if you don't mind, I'll I'll answer the question about the metrics. So, okay. So about the metrics, I wanted you to. Get, I'll give you a little bit of a background on this. So I've struggled with this idea of a checklist and not being able to say is this age friendly or is this age unfriendly. And then using the walkability score as a reference point for developing a metric for age friendliness. Mm -hmm. One of the problems with me, for me with the, a metric for walkability is fine, it allows you to make an evidence-based decision about where you're going to live or whatever. But walkability, just like age friendliness, is dynamic. So how do we capture the fact that at one moment something is age friendly and then a, mi a minute later it might not be. Mm -hmm. And so the flexibility that you're talking about, we've taken that into consideration. Uh, we actually have applied for a big grant from Google to see if we can uh, develop an algorithm for this. And the flexibility that we're going to try to build into that is, is talk about things like transportation and weather and all these other factors that might make something age unfriendly for the moment, mm -hmm. be able, we're, that we're able to capture that. So that's what we're trying to do. I will look forward to hearing more about that. We look forward to getting the grant so we can do it. Yeah. But it's, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? And the caregiver data? Yeah. As soon as we have it analyzed, I can get it to you. But I can tell you that that's an issue in the community. And that's okay. also why we did the qualitative part as well. Again, there's only so many surveys that you can administer. You, you always want to throw in as much as you can, but at the same time, it becomes burdensome. So by talking to people and, and using this qualitative approach, where we're asking them what are the issues, hopefully, and we have, I haven't seen the data yet, but. Mm -hmm. Issues of gender may have come up, or uh, issues of um, informal caregiving may have arisen. So again, we try and do our best, and that. But that's why I, I personally always try and use a survey with qualitative interviews, so you can get as broad of a picture as possible. Just a final point on that: I'll tell you that one of the, the issues that the theme emerged from the focus groups with the clinicians was that family dynamics, especially, are very hard to navigate when the the family is acting as an intermediary between the clinician and the actual the patient. And so that, that came up over and over again within that group. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, we, I know that one of the focus groups was uh, for practitioners. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some practitioners in the room who are aspiring social workers. And I wanted to know if you could sort of shed light on 
what are some of the professionals who are working in that neighborhood saying in terms of their uh, perspective in seeing seniors uh, who they might uh, be coming across? So the, the big problem that practitioners had in the community, especially around some of the questions that we were asking, and we said, well, how do you know if a senior is socially isolated? And they said, well, we don't know. We only see a snapshot of them when they come to see us for 15 minutes or not. And then they said, well, how do I know if some, how do I define somebody who's socially isolated? Do I bring out a little checklist or something like that? And even after I've identified them as socially isolated, what do I do with them? I've, I've identified them. I don't have a way of assessing the intervention or anything like that. And then next thing is, well, who do I hand them off to? Like, where do I refer them to? So this was one of the challenges that came up um, in the clinician section. Another challenge that came up, and I think this is really fascinating for me, was that we talk about language. In this, in this particular community, there's a language barrier because a lot of the people coming to this community are speaking Cantonese or Mandarin. And actually addressing the language barrier created a new barrier. And the language barrier, once addressed, created a cultural barrier. Because some of the things that were happening at home, for example, isolation, depression, or abuse, are not something you can talk to somebody from your community about. Mm -hmm. And so there's shame and stigma that's attached, and so there was a, a fear of cultural judgment happening that this person didn't want to share their story. So yes, I can talk to you about whatever in my language, but there are certain things that are now off limits that I won't talk to with my clinician from the same cultural background as myself, okay? Um, uh, you've kindly agreed to stay after, yes, but I know that yeah. some people are trying to get back to courses or, or uh, work. So I do want to thank you all, and I think a round of applause would be appropriate. So you can... They're right there. Okay. I have my eye on that mug. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you've got to probably presented for us so long. So like, uh, dinner I have a little that. collection, yes. So we do have just a, a token of our appreciation. And to remember us by, this is my favorite. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It comes in very rapid form.